Some key ideas that we've discussed already, again, a little review. Number one, unlimited growth. When it comes to church growth, our goal is to receive as many as the Lord will add. Three, 300, 3,000, 30,000, or to multiply congregations indefinitely. We're in the business of growth. We want to be prepared to experience growth, whether that is growth of our local congregation or growth through ministry development. Growth is not just numbers. Growth is how you grow a ministry. How effective it is. How many people. I, let's just take a food ministry because I know you've done that you know, in the past. So a food ministry you know, has three or four families that come every week. Growing that ministry is, whoa, maybe 50 families come. Maybe you, you add different uh, counseling situations. One of the things we do, every family that comes for food, Okay, uh, we give them food, but inside every one of those bags of food, there is Christianity for beginners. So we, we cross feed the two. Okay, so that type of ministry, that type of ministry growth. Number two, church organization and growth. Organization precedes growth in any enterprise, we said. New Testament organizational pattern will permit, not automatically produce. It permits growth. Okay? God's the one who adds. Now there are a lot of strategies for church organization, but only one pattern. I have to keep repeating that. And having a New Testament pattern will prepare us for unlimited growth that God will give and He will give it. He's promised it. Number three, the New Testament pattern for organization requires us to identify, implement, and integrate the ministries of the church described in the New Testament. So in, in my last lesson, we kind of went through the five areas of ministry and what they were. What are these ministries? What are we supposed to be doing? Uh, we said you know, in evangelism, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be communicating the information of the gospel to those who do not have it, to those who don't believe, to those who have never heard it. How you do that, that's your business. You, know, you send out flyers four times a year, fine. Ads in the paper, articles, radio program, DVDs, internet, door knocking, gospel meetings. You pick one, just pick one and do it. Okay? All right, so you have to identify, implement, and integrate. So let's talk about identification. In Acts 2, which I read to you, 1 to 47, it describes only five ministry. Every ministry activity of the church can be put into one of these five. So in order of biblical appearance, as I mentioned, and you're going to learn these by heart, evangelism, education, fellowship, worship, and service. So unless a church is fully aware of the existence and nature of these ministries, it can't it can't, it can't do the program. If you're not aware that fellowship is just as important as evangelism and education is just as important as worship, unless you're, not aware, you're aware of these five basic ministries, you can't put the plan into operation. Now, once we understand the nature and purpose of each ministry, the work of ministers is to implement each ministry. In other words, you're full-time guys. What are they supposed to be doing? Well, they're supposed to be implementing those five ministries. That's what they're supposed to be doing. The degree of success the church has in each area is dependent on its size and knowledge and maturity and the skill of its leaders and how well they know these five areas of ministry, what they're about and how to accomplish them. But the task for each congregation should be clear to everybody. In other words, how do we evangelize in our community? What training and resources do we have? Or who will teach the church? And how and where will we do this teaching? And where will we meet for fellowship and worship? And who will organize these things for the edification of the brethren? And what are the needs of the church and community? And how are we going to meet these? Though, you know, if you're having a meeting, those are the questions that should be asked and answered. Building a congregation is like building a house. Each part needs to be installed in its proper order. Building a church begins with evangelism and then framed with teaching, Fellowship and worship and service are added to complete the structure and prepare it to repeat the cycle. That's what growth is. So if we don't have a plan of implementation or if we leave parts out, 
the church is incomplete and stunted in its growth. Remember, the goal is unlimited growth. The approach is New Testament organization and ministry. So you have to identify the ministries. You have to implement them. In other words, get those plates up and get them spinning. And then thirdly, integration. How do these ministries work together? How do the elders and ministers and deacons and staff and saints, how do they work together in a cohesive system that exercises these ministries effectively and biblically? And so the ministry management system that I'm going to propose is one way to integrate all of these five ministries in such a way as to provide effective leadership, effective ministry, on an organizational base for unlimited growth. You see, without a plan to manage ministry, it's difficult to analyze our strengths and weaknesses. It's difficult to assign tasks and responsibility. It leads to the leveling of growth. What we end up doing is we end up doing the least, not the most. We end up doing the easiest, not the hardest. We end up doing what we know instead of learning what we don't know. That's what we end up doing. And that's, that's why churches plateau. We're, we're cruising. We're just cruising along. And a lot of time it's not because of bad faith. It's because we don't know how to get that thing into drive. We just don't know the mechanics of how to do it. So now we're going to enter into the how do we do it. Okay? How do you begin at your church? Well, I would say carefully. Carefully. So first of all, how do you do it? Well, you identify the ministries. Everybody's got a copy of that flow chart, if you'll flip over there. A review of the five ministries, what they are, what their goals should be, how they ought to function. There we go. You, the ministers and elders and deacons and support staff, need to know this, need to be in agreement. You need to teach the church. Look at this. See this up here? That's what you should have. Yeah, you got one of those? It's blank. That's a flow chart. There, there are the five ministries. And so we ought to know and agree, for example, what is biblical evangelism and what are we doing in evangelism? The preaching of the gospel to the lost with the objective of their belief and obedience. Is there anything we're doing in this church that can be put in that box? Evangelism. If you don't know what the ministry, whatever it is, is about, how can you minister? <laughs> if you don't know what the objective of the teaching is, what are you going to teach? So the first step is to identify the five ministry areas and be very clear as to the biblical nature and purpose and who's in charge. So let me show you this. Here's the flow chart at Choctaw. Okay? Here's the flow chart at Choctaw. Notice in the flow chart at Choctaw, let me get my copy here, we've got five areas of ministry. Notice under evangelism we've broken it down into three areas of evangelism. Local outreach. So in evangelism Elder Steve Harrison and Elder Harold Weaver are the elders responsible for that area of ministry, along with a brother, Dayton Cassie, who's also one of our elders at Choctaw. So we've broken it into three areas. Local outreach. Local means Choctaw and you know, the surrounding community. What are we doing? Well, visitor follow-up. Who's responsible for that? The elders and the ministers. Personal Bible studies. You know, somebody says, I want to have a personal... Who's responsible for organizing and assigning those? Uh, Marty Kessler is a, a responsible for that. Uh, new converts. New converts need to be taught. You know, we need to kind of uh, integrate them. Who's responsible for that? You know, Joe was baptized Friday. Who's going to bring Joe the packet that gives all the information about the church, that you know, gets his name into the computer, assigns him a mailbox, uh, and all the rest of it, finds out you know, uh, his gift assessment. What, what are you good at? What do you like? Who's going to do that? Well, here in our church, the person who's responsible for making those assignments, that's Marty. There's no job that, has, that doesn't have a name next to it. No job that does not have a name next to it. So we have local. We have domestic outreach. Our domestic outreach is our internet ministry. 
So BibleTalk.tv, well, Mike Mazzalongo and Hal Gatewood are the two. You know, Hal works full-time for BibleTalk.tv and I'm a full-time minister responsible for it. So we're responsible for that. Uh, this, we also have a fully uh, equipped TV studio uh, at Choctaw and Hal and I, and actually this is, this is uh, not up to date. There's a name missing and that's Bob Chilton. His name is there too because he works in the studio. We have international evangelism. That's outside the United States. Who is responsible for that? Dayton Cassie is responsible. We support missionaries in Haiti, Kenya, uh, uh, mission requests that come in, mission trips, special collections, World Bible School. There's a name next to uh, everything there. All right, I'm, I'm not going to go through every name here, so fear not, okay, we, we, we go, but I just want to do a couple of them just to show you. Let's look at education, for example. So notice I said in education, who is the elder? Like someone, something happens in education, you know? And someone says, well, we need to talk to the elders. No, no, the elders don't have an entire, we have seven, we don't have seven elders getting together to talk about one thing that's happening in education. We have an elder over education. If there's an issue or a problem, we go see that elder. In this case, it's uh, Bob Chilton. So what does he oversee exactly? Well, all the classes. Well, all the adult and teen classes, I, I work with that. I create the curriculum for those classes. Uh, EPIC, EPIC is, uh, it's like LTC. Is that LTC? Yeah, it's like LTC, but it's local. It's, it's in Oklahoma City, okay? Who's in charge of that? Bonnie Bella and Celestia Bennett, these two women, they're responsible for that. Uh, preschool, uh, uh, Nisi uh, Henderson and uh, Jenny Anthony, time travelers, teachers, even the workroom. Something happened in the workroom. Somebody broke something in the workroom. Who do we talk to? Well, we know who to talk to in the workroom. It's Evelyn Elkins or Drew Shires. They're responsible for that. And so on and so on, all the way down the, all the way down the line. Now I want to show you something in service ministry, okay? So we have evangelism, education, fellowship, uh, where's worship? Worship's at the end. Then we have uh, service ministry. And service ministry is divided into three areas. It's divided into administration, Okay, and so under administration we have the office staff. Marty's the office manager. We have a secretary, bookkeeper, custodian, church directory, and so on and so forth. The website. Every single ministry has a name next to it and has a budget. And every single ministry has a budget number. So in evangelism, for example, visitor follow, uh, visitor, oh I'll do mine, uh, Bible talk, that's EV. That's the area of evangelism. And uh, you know, 130, that's the studio. 131, that's copying material. EV 13006, that's uh, computer equipment. 07 is software. 08 is plastic cases. 09. So when we, when we need to buy something, we don't have seven elders making a decision that we got to buy a new computer. We have a budget. We simply make a purchase order. We write down what ministry it's for, exactly what area it's for. We put the number in. We know what our budget, bang, it goes to the office. We have an elder who is in charge of finance. He reviews it. Oh, OK, are they spending their budget? Yeah, it's all good. Check, he signs it, and away we go. That's implementation. That's systematized. Okay? Because we don't want to bog down the system with you know, administrative details. We want to minister to people, not to paper. OK, so that's our, that's our uh, flowchart. And this flowchart has to be updated every month, because every month there's a new ministry. There's a new thing that somebody has been added, somebody's been taken away. So the beauty of computers, of course, as you know, you can go in and make changes. Boom, and the secretary spits one of these out. You know, the computer uh, does it and everybody gets a copy. We know what the new flowchart is. We know who's in charge of everything. And we can add as many ministries to any area as we want. So somebody comes up with a bright idea about teaching. Oh, I got a great idea. We're gonna... oh, I'll, I'll mention that. So we got a great idea. You know what we're going to do? Somebody says, I have a great idea. You know what we're going to do? We're going to have a health fair, a children's health fair. Oh yeah, why? Well, because in our congregation we have many professionals. So we have some medical doctors, we have optometrists, we have nurses, we have all kinds of people there. 
So in our fellowship hall, we're going to set up uh, booths. And the doctors and the eye doctors and the dentists and the, the, uh, the uh, social workers, they're, they're going to offer screenings, health screenings, give away toothbrushes, all kinds of stuff you know, for children in our community. And our parking lot, because we have a lot of people, we'll put them to use. We're going to have a fire truck with the deputy fire chief. We're going to have an ambulance with a paramedic. We're going to have a cop car with, uh, with one of the guys who's a, a police officer. And we're going to have a helicopter because one of our members is a nurse. She works for uh, Air Kid One, which is the OU Children's Hospital neonatal, and she travels with the helicopter. So she asked permission and they're going to fly the helicopter to our church and land it in the parking lot. Do you think we're going to have trouble drawing children that day? Do you think so? Oh, 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 wait a minute. I forgot to tell you. After they do the booths and visit the things and get the little badges and hats, and stuff, oh, I forgot to tell you. The very last booth, VBS sign up. VBS sign up for the following week. What do you think? You think it'll work? Where does that go in my ministry chart? Evangelism, it could go there, but for all practical purposes, it's under education. Why? Because the, the tip of the spear is what? That booth at the end, what is it going to be? VBS. This is a VBS project. So the elders said, you know, somebody had, we never did this before, so somebody said, I got a great idea and brought it to the elders and they said, yeah, we think it's great. How much money do you need? Uh, 2,000 bucks. Okay. You know, next year, because we brought it several months ago, okay, next year we'll put $2,000 in the budget for that. We said we needed a youth and family minister because we've got so many young families moving in, so on and so forth, growth. We need a youth and family minister. So the elders turned around and said to the congregation, OK, we're going to raise the budget level on Sunday. You know, for the weekly budget total is going to raise for 2014. But here's the deal we're going to make with you, church. If you meet budget every single week for the first three and a half months of 2014, we will hire a youth and family minister. It's up to you. If you want to give to it, go ahead. And if you do it, we promise we'll, we'll hire a youth and family minister. And if we don't make budget for the first three and a half months of the year, then we won't hire because you're telling us we don't want that. We don't want to pay for that. What do you think happened? Yeah, we're $2,000 ahead of budget at the three and a half and in two weeks, we have our first and probably greatest candidate coming to interview for that job. People give to ministry. If the church is ministering and the congregation sees that ministering has happened, they will rise to the occasion. They will give to it. OK, let me show you your flow chart. This is Ponca City's flow chart. And you have a copy of it. You can flip it over if you want to look at it here. Notice in evangelism, local outreach, Hispanic mission, Friday night class, gospel meeting once a year, twice, once, once a year gospel meeting, at least once a year. That's it, local outreach. What's the Friday night class? What is it? Bible study here for the community. OK. Uh, domestic outreach, jail ministry, I get that. International outreach, the Cuban ministry that uh, Bud was explaining to me that you, you, you've been very involved in in Jamaica mission. OK. Do you think that your local outreach is adequate? No, because uh, it, now, is it biblical? Oh, well, of course it is. You know, Hispanic mission. In other words, do you have Hispanic brethren meeting here? Is that, is that the idea? Working on. You're working on it. Okay. Uh, same thing, Friday night class, open to the community, okay, and, and, and then at least once a year gospel meeting. Well, this plate is not very big. It's, 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 you know, if you want growth, you have, to, you have to punch up local evangelism. Okay? In other words, the 10,000 people that live around you, you've got to find a way to get the information to them. That's your job. Get the information to them. Let the, let the word do its work. 
but it won't do its work if you don't get the information to them. Uh, education is pretty straightforward. You know, uh, one of the things about the Churches of Christ is most of them have a pretty good education uh, ministry. Fellowship, new member pack, visitation, young marriage, worship, mm -hmm. service administration, benevolence, and maintenance. So this is your, um, your flow chart. I'm going to have something else to say about that in a few minutes, but I just wanted to show you what yours is, and you're going to see how to work with this. I'm going to give you something to do to work with your, uh, your flow chart. All right, so once you know in theory what ministry is about, you need to diagnose your own congregation to see what ministries are being done. So we need to create a flow chart in order to plug each existing ministry into the right category once you've, once you've done that. Now, once the ministries uh, themselves are plugged in, you need to assign the elders, deacons. Now, one of the things that I, I forgot to ask that I didn't get was, there's not a name next to each one of this. And I'm asking you, is there a name next to one of these things? OK, so if you're creating a flow chart, there has to be a name next to each ministry area. Very important. Why? Because you need to know who's accountable for that particular area. Okay. Uh, this will show you at a glance what you are doing and who is doing what in every area. And it'll also show you how many people are actually involved in ministry you know, uh, in your congregation. Then you need to educate the congregation to use and to refer to this system so that you're all talking the same language when you talk about ministry. Ultimately, the role of ministers in a growing church will be to train, assign people to ministry and manage the system itself so that the body can, so that the body can grow. So uh, my assignment, and I guess you know, we'll talk to the elders and Bud and so on and so forth. The assignment is, the first step is create your flow chart so at a glance you can see this is what we are doing. And these are the people who are in charge of what we, of what we are doing so that you can better, um, you can better uh, manage it. All right, integration. Once we grasp the nature and objective of each ministry area and we create a ministry model where all present and future ministries can be plugged into, if somebody has a great idea, if you have the flow chart and the list, you know exactly where that great idea is going to be put under what ministry, who's going to be in charge, who's going to be working it, and you also know which budget it'll be under. That, that's a tremendous, you know, it's a tremendous help for follow through, because in church work I've noticed people have great ideas, but there's no follow through, and there's no follow through because they don't know the mechanics of how to take an idea in the abstract and make it concrete and workable. And what I'm talking about when I talk about the flow chart is, that gives you a tool to work with to take abstract ideas and put them down on paper so that you know where it fits, who's going to do it, which elder is going to be responsible, is there money in that budget, how it affects and how it can integrate with other ministries in that area. That's it. Very simple piece of equipment. In other words, you've identified the ministries that you have, you've organized them into the five areas, you have the leadership and the ministry coordinators in place. Okay. How do you kickstart the process? How do you kickstart the process? Well, first of all, encourage and empower each ministry area to come up with their own plans and projects for their area of ministry. Now, I have a thing here that I'm looking for. Oh yeah, here it is. You got this uh, idea worksheet here? Everybody got this? If you flip. If you flip over, you'll find it. OK. Now, we're not going to do this today. I leave this as an assignment, you know, that, that uh, if you do a follow-up to this seminar, I leave you this assignment to do as a follow-up. OK? What time? How are we doing on time? OK. So I want you to, to uh, uh, break up into five groups. Maybe the elders can help you know, assign people. And you break up into five groups. And what you do in your group, you come up with three new ideas for evangelism. So let's say this table here is the evangelism group. All right? 
This group will come up with three, the best three ideas they have for evangelism. They could be for local evangelism, domestic or international, whatever it is, but it'll be evangelism. And since you already know the goal of evangelism is to transfer the information of the gospel to the people who don't know it, at least you know what it is you're supposed to be doing, right? Then you have another group responsible for education. So a sign, let's say this table here is going to be doing education. Well, you have your meeting and you come up with the best three ideas you can for education. And since you know what the goal of education is, right, to communicate the teachings of Christ and help people integrate that into their lives, well then you know what kind of ideas you have to come up with. And anyways, I'm not going to repeat the whole thing, but fellowship, you know, worship, maintenance. I want you to come up with three ideas in each of these areas. All right, now, what do you do next? What do you do next is, once you've got the three areas, you get together at a, at a general meeting and you pick the best idea from each area. The best idea. You know, uh, so this group here is evangelism. They share their three ideas with the whole group and let the group decide, you know what, number one idea, that's pretty good, but number two, we, that's doable. We could do that. All right, let's, so number two idea. We're going to do that. In education, do the same thing. And then what do you do? You implement the best idea from every area of ministry and you add it to the flow chart that you already have for your work. See what I'm saying? Remember what I told you the equation was? Ministry equals growth. So now with your flow chart, you know what your ministries are. You know what you have. And you also know the goal of each of these ministries. And now you have a new idea for each area of ministry. And you put those into play. And then watch what happens. If those begin to gather some momentum, you begin to have results, maybe idea number two <laughs> needs to be implemented and so on and so forth. OK? All right. So how do you manage the process? Let me finish up with this here. Well, first of all, as I say, encourage and empower. Those were the ideas. Elders need to encourage the congregation to come up with ideas, empower them to put them into, put them into play. You have to have two types of meetings. One is the ministry meeting. An elder and or a deacon and coordinators meet to plan and organize activities in their area of ministry. So you need to break yourselves up into five ministry areas. And that's pretty easy. How many here teach uh, Sunday school or classes? Any, any hands up? One, two, three, four. OK, there's your committee. How many here are responsible for organizing the potlucks, the dinners, the cooking, the, all that kind of stuff? Anybody? OK, oh, all right, there's, there's, your, there's your committee fellowship group, and so on and so forth. Who's responsible? Who mows the lawn, takes care of the exterior, you know, does the custodial work? Anybody? Nobody? Nobody does that? Uh, there's a couple of guys back there. One, two, three, four, five. There's your, there's your you know, uh, service is administration, that's office stuff, benevolence, that's you know, counseling, food giveaways, all that kind of stuff. And then there's maintenance. Well, maintenance is maintenance, right? The grounds, the building, so there, there's the maintenance crew. Uh, uh, usually the ministers and a couple of the elders are in, in, in the area of benevolence because they, they, they do counseling and so on and so forth. And then administration. Again, the preacher, usually is the office manager too, so on and so forth. So you break yourselves up into groups and when you have ministry meetings, you talk about, have your flow chart ahead in front of you and say to yourselves, well, how's this going and do we have enough money to do that and will we do this and will we do that? And oh yes, by the way, we need to now integrate this new idea that we decided, whatever that is, into this area. How are we going to do that? How much will it cost? We need to come up with some costs so that we can run it by the elders and see if we can put that in the budget and so on and so forth. So that's ministry meetings. And then, then we have to have elders meetings. Oh dear. Elders meetings. Well, you already have elders meeting. But elders meetings have to have two parts. I have found 
in my experience. One part is the ministry agenda. Okay? The ministry agenda is how are we doing in evangelism, education, fellowship? Are there problems? Are there budget issues? Are there equipment we have to purchase? Are there people we have to hire? You know, ministry things that need to be talked about. You know, the, the, the admin people have given us 2015's budget, their recommendations. Let's take a look at that and see if we can approve that, whatever. Ministry stuff, okay? And then they take a break and then they do shepherding stuff. No color of paint, no do we put in grass in the back. We don't discuss any of that. Shepherding meetings are only about the sheep. And one of the biggest problems in congregations is that the ministry meetings suck up 90% of the elders' time and they only have 10% left for the sheep. I mean, and I, I'm not saying this for this, I mean, that's you know, across the board. And so elders have to designate the time. We're in a ministry meeting, we're going to give it 45 minutes and then boom, whatever we, we haven't done, we'll just do next time, take a break, have a prayer, okay. Shepherding meaning. The way we do it, and as a lot of other congregations do it, we have shepherding lists and they're just broken down in alphabetical order. We have seven shepherds. The congregation is broken into seven groups and just alphabetically, just to, to make it simple. And each shepherd, each elder is responsible for that group. Meaning, if someone has to go to the hospital or, or you know, if Sister Abel, A, if Sister Abel, who's in uh, Brother Chilton, because he's the you know, uh, top of the alphabet there among the elders, you know, if Sister Abel is in Brother Chilton's group and she's brought to the hospital and so on and so forth, guess who's going to go to the hospital and make the time to go see Sister Abel? First responder. Well, first responder is going to be Brother Chilton. Why? Because she's in his shepherding group. And Sister Abel also knows that Brother Chilton is her elder. So if she has an issue, a complaint, a this, a that, she's not going to form a posse. She's not going to bend the ear of every deacon in the place. She's going to look at the chart and say, oh, Brother Chilton is my elder. I'm in his shepherding group. Well, I'm going to call Brother Chilton and say, Brother Chilton, it's just too cold in the auditorium on Sunday morning. We need to get a better heating system and whatever. Because we don't want the sheep to fall through the cracks. We don't want the sheep to have crisis and not have the shepherds be at their side. And we don't want to burn out our shepherds. Because if you're a shepherd and you think you're responsible for 95 to 110 families, it's too much. But if you have 15 families, okay, 15, it's still a lot, but 15 families is manageable. Does that mean that one elder can't visit somebody in the Z group? Well, of course not. But as far as first response is concerned, okay, if, if, brother, uh, if brother Weaver, another one of our elders, wants to know about Sister Abel, who do you think he's going to call? Hey, Bob, uh, yeah, how's Sister Abel? You know, I got to make announcements on Sunday. What, what can I report about? Well, I went to see her at the hospital. I think she's, be, oh, she's stable. She's getting out in two days. Great, okay, thanks for letting me know. That's how it works. Two types of meetings. This type of approach can accommodate growth because we have a new family that comes in. That's only one family added just to one elder. Not all of them get it. And unless the next 60 people that you know, become members of our congregation all start with the letter A, <laughs> then we'd have to redistribute. Okay? OK, so last thing, what is it going to take? What will it take? What will it take to make it work? Commitment. You all need to be committed to making it work. It's got to become our system, not just Mike's system. Or yeah, we had the meeting system. You need to make up your minds that you're willing to change and commit yourselves to making it work. If you have a cohesive commitment from the leadership, the church will follow. If the leadership said, this is the way we're going to do things from here on in, then the church, I'll, I'll go one further. I'll go one further. Not the church will follow. The church wants to follow. The church wants 
leadership. They want their leaders to lead. They want to see them leading. They want to support them in their leadership. People who cause trouble, usually in the minority, the majority of the people in the church love and respect their elders and they want them to grow and they want them to lead and they want to say amen to the things that their elders are saying. So if you have, again, a cohesive commitment from the leadership, the church will want to follow. Secondly, continuity. All of your plans, all of your ministries, all of your communications need to key off of the ministry model. The budget needs to be broken down along the five areas of ministry. Uh, uh, the website, our website, broken down the five areas of ministry. The bulletin, the five areas of ministry. Every, this is the basis. We have a budget, and I showed you briefly, I think it's back here somewhere. There's the fellowship budget. Well, the fellowship budget, see, FS 3300, special events. So FS 3305, women's conference. They've assigned $250 for that. Uh, the church picnic, $350. Homecoming, that was our 70th anniversary, $2,000, and so on and so forth. Every single thing, every single ministry in the church, every single piece of paper, budget or otherwise, follows this model. So everyone knows exactly where they are and what is going on. And then of course the last, uh, let me just get to the other two, the last thing it needs of course is our Lord Himself. Let's remember that the power comes from Christ and the glory goes to Christ. The system, it's just a tool. That's all it is, it's just a tool Hopefully it's a biblical tool that will enable you to serve the church to the glory of Christ. In the end, I believe that a congregation that uses Bible tools such as a church organization and a system for ministry, uh, if you use that to reach a Bible goal, unlimited growth, uh, that church is a true New Testament church in the spirit of biblical uh, restorationism. Remember, the Lord was adding to the number day by day those who were being saved and those were being saved were following a New Testament church. So what do we want to be? What kind of New Testament church? A faithful New Testament. We want to be a faithful New Testament church. And if we succeed in being a faithful New Testament church, what will happen to us? The Lord will, the Lord will add. And what, what's the mechanics? The mechanics are the New Testament ministry system. Five areas of ministry, get those plates in the air and get them spinning.